Hello, professors and doctors, colleagues from everywhere. My name is Professor Hisham Sayed. I'm professor of nephrology at Shams University, Cairo, Egypt. I'm the chair of the chapter in Egyptian Society of Nephrology, as well in the African countries. Today, we will have a topic of intradialytic hypotension in the pathogenesis and mechanism incidents prevalence, as well how to treat and to manage. I hope that this video will illustrate a lot of the mechanism and the approach for treatment. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully that it will be of value. Uh, considering this topic today, I understand how it is very difficult. However, the topics of the intradialytic hypotension has a many aspects, including the definition, the physiological mechanism for blood pressure control, the consequences of intradialytic hypotension, the prevalence, the hemodynamic instability related to renal replacement therapy, the plasma refilling rate and how it affects the hypotension episodes in patients either in acute kidney injury or in mental hemodialysis. And finally, what is our approach for the management? And if you look again to the roadmap of our talk, as well, the objective of the talk for the genius of learning objective is to understand different mechanisms of intradialytic hypotension and to build up knowledge that subsequently will do a better management. So we'll go through this roadmap all over more than 130 slides. I hope that we cannot exceed more than an hour in the presentation to cover as well the questions. So we'll have the definition, the pathophysiology, consequences, special situation like acute kidney injury, the health is dependent, as well approaches for the treatment. Let us start with the story from the end. Intrabiotic hypotension is a self-reported patient burden, has many complications like vascular access failure, has higher cardiovascular events and death, and more on early onset showed higher mortality if the intrabiotic hypotension occurs in the first hour of the dialysis session. And intrabiotic hypotension has many multi-organ ischemic changes that's called stunning due to decreased blood flow. So this is a story from the end. And for all the general audience that intrabiotic hypotension is more than a simple complication during hemodialysis. We have to look forward for that carefully, for the cause and the preventive strategy to treat the patient efficiently as intravirate hypotension has a higher mortality, which is already high in patients on end stage kidney disease receiving dialysis. These graphics summarize what are suffering in the patient with CKD on dialysis. We have two periods. One period is intradialytic, and the other period is the intradialytic phase. While the intradialytic phases, including hypervolemia, left ventricular hypertrophy, hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, chloritis, sleep apnea, this quality of life, nutritional affection, Inside the hemodialysis as well, we have an inflammatory stress, biological stress, hypoxemic stress, nutritional stress, and sudden death, including. So the patient has many morbidity, which is different in both situations, either during the session or intradialytic period in between the sessions. We will uh, uh, we will uh, discuss today mainly the hypotension episodes. 
pulmonary hypertension as well in patients on dialysis is undiagnosed clinically because many patients experience from the pulmonary congestion, recurrent pulmonary impulse, especially with patients on catheter who develop pulmonary hypertension. And this pulmonary hypertension and the right ventricular strain affect as well the circulation and the filling pressure of the left ventricle, subsequently the cardiac output. So pulmonary hypertension in hemodialysis needs further attention and investigation. So to summarize the intradialytic morbidity, the dialysis symptomatology, the hypotension, cramps, headache, stress, cognitive dysfunction, plus interdialytic morbidity, including chronic fluid overload, hypertension, sodium overload, uremic disorders, electrolyte imbalance, arrhythmia, inflammation, fatigue, and more and more of the protein energy wasting and frailty. And if we put the intradialytic and interdialytic morbidity, we have an end organ damage, including cardiovascular diseases, atherosclerosis, gut ischemia, loss of residual kidney function, arrhythmia, and the vascular calcification. The risk factors for intradialytic hypotension include not only, but include on the left here, diabetes, cardiovascular disorder, systolic and diastolic dysfunction, ischemic heart disease, arrhythmia, vascular calcification, stressing on the autonomic dysfunction, especially in diabetics, poor nutritional status, hypoalbuminemia, and its effect on the oncotic pressure of the plasma and the refilling will come later. Female sex, age, old, and patients who started systolic blood pressure below 100. Importantly, multifactorial effect may be presented on the same patient at the same time, which makes the difficulties on that. If we return back to the physiology of the heart, we understand that the contractions of the myocardium depending on the actin and myosin, and this is facilitated by the calcium channels and the receptors of adrenergic receptors. What's called myocardial spanning, meaning that impaired systolic function during dialysis due to ischemia and decrease in myocardial blood flow. 30% of people on dialysis experiences myocardial spanning, while intradialytic hypotension could attribute to both the stunning effect as well as the hypotension from the stunning. And if you look to the causes of death on dialysis, we can find that cardiac arrest. Interestingly, we know that dialysis calcium in the physiological and the higher than physiological, although it suppresses the PTH and increases the calcium load, however, makes more stable hemodynamic during dialysis probably could be related to the calcium channel and action of the actin myosin contraction on the ventricular function. There is several associations between intradialytic hypotension and significant arrhythmia during dialysis. And this study in conclusion is common in maintenance hemodialysis patients. The range between 10% and 20%. Expression of the autonomic control of the cardiac function during hemodialysis predicts cardiovascular outcomes in end-stage renal disease. The response of hemodynamic control mechanisms can be independently predictive indexes for lower hospitalized cardiovascular events, which imply that patients who have better autonomic control may have better cardiovascular outcomes probably due to cardiac compensation during that. So the definition of intradialytic hypotension occurs on four definitions. What is the definition name? The word originates from the Latin name definiered to limit or to pound. And the definition lies in between four categories. Occurrence of low blood pressure below a certain threshold, 
or nadir, intradialytic blood pressure control, patient reported intradialytic symptoms, and finally, medical, usually nursing intervention during dialysis, aiming at restoring the blood volume. So this is the fourth criteria to define the intradialytic hypotension besides lower blood pressure and is a must to do in that intervention during the dialysis and the patient related intradialytic symptoms like cramps, vomiting, and syncope. The percent is between 10 to 12 percent. Several definitions may be related to the outcome as well. Looking to the literature on the definition of intradialytic hypotension, you can find that the key Duke guideline 2005 and the update to uh, 2020, while the UK, European, and Japanese all lie below here on the four categories we described of major decrease in the blood pressure, decrease in systolic pressure more than 20, or in systolic blood pressure below 90, associated with symptoms, intermediate intervention, and uh, for, co for sure, uh, other comorbidities. The blood pressure and the volume management in dialysis conclusion from the key UK guideline 2020 saying that the four categories on the middle, systolic blood pressure accompanied by intervention, saline polis, for example, decrease of the uh, blood pump flow, systolic blood pressure drop of a certain degree, never intradialytic systolic blood pressure below 90, is common in patients with intradialytic hypotension. So any symptomatic decrease in systolic blood pressure or another intradialytic systolic blood pressure below 90 should promote reassessment of blood pressure and volume management. So the measure of intradialytic blood pressure behavior is not enough to define intradialytic hypotension. We have either intradialytic symptoms like syncope, abdominal pain, cramps from ischemia, dizziness, uh, fainting, restlessness, yawning, or intradialytic intervention like Trinderberg, uh, positioning, fluid administration, stop or decrease the blood flow and decrease or stop the ultrafiltration rate. Probably this importantly, cessation of the dialysis treatment affects the adequacy from the intervention and uh, interruption of the patient. So the definitions coming for either single component and it is in the literature is not strong, but multi-component definition is essential, two or three of the four criteria and the more complex definition. So the measurements alone is not enough, but if you define that systolic blood pressure below 90, and despite clinical significance, there is no consensus up to now evidence-based medical definition for the condition. I would like the multi-component definition that contain two or more of the criteria, in particular intervention. More complex definition distinguish episodic hypotension event from gradual intradialytic blood pressure decline. For example, patient may start the dialysis by systolic blood pressure around the 50, followed by decrease in systolic blood pressure to 110, but still there is no symptoms. I don't know exactly if this is a patient with intravaritic hypotension according to the basic definition of the another decrease in the blood pressure without symptom or intervention makes the, the uh, uh, probability and the diagnosis of intravaritic hypotension difficult. So symptom or intervention requirements are often added to full or another uh, blood pressure criteria. <coughs> Intradialytic hypertension is very common with sepsis, myocardial infarction, tamponade, pulmonary embolism, dialyzer reaction. And the decline is not linear with a relatively steeper decline noted in the first quarter of hemodialysis and this carries the risk. Rapid decline in plasma osmolality and impaired implementation of compensatory cardiovascular system mechanisms are the main pathogenesis of intradialytic hypertension. If you can see that there is early intradialytic hypotension, which appears on the first hour of dialysis, and late, which mainly related to uh, ultrafiltration. 
So the early intrabaritic hypotension carries the major risk. Early uh, intrabaritic hypotension could be related to endoxemia, uh, impurities, septicemia, castor-related dialysis uh, hypersensitivity, while it could be related to warmer dialysis, assist ultrafiltration, and for sure low serum albumin, as we will discuss later how albumin affects the ultrafiltration. The compensation of ultrafiltration was called impaired plasma refilling, will highlight in short at the end of the, this talk. So looking for, looking for the physiological mechanism of blood pressure control to understand the pathophysiology of intrabaritic hypotension, we can find that increasing in the cardiac output by different receptors and the different reflexes, like increases the preload, in plasma refilling, increasing the peripheral resistance, including that the autonomic function of the adrenal receptors and the calcium channel. So in terms of any of that, of the cardiac output or the peripheral resistance will induce significantly intrabiotic hypotension. For the junior, what's the cardiac output? Cardiac output is a vascular extension multiplied by the stroke volume, and each cardiac output can maintain. Cardiac output on the stage, cardiac is a pump, and the heart can only pump what is presented to it, like exactly the dialyzer can remove toxins, what is presented. However, in the cardiac output needing venous return, and such a venous return depending on the venous tone. If you have the preload deficiency, we will have a decrease in the stroke volume. And if we have a hypovolemia, subsequently the stroke volume will be lower. So if we put the peripheral resistance vasodilatation as well, the hypovolemia will find severe intradiuretic hypotension. So stroke volume with decreasing cardiac output, decreasing myocardial contractility, like we called so earlier, the stunning, decreased venous return from any cause like stasis, autonomic neuropathy, vasodilator drugs, hypovolemia, allergic reaction to the extracorporeal circuit, as well as septicemia or bacteremia, which carries a lot of both vasodilatation, myocarditis, as well inhibitory effect on the cardiac contractility. So the factors like volume of the blood and the force of contraction push the heart to the stroke volume rapidly. As a compensation, the heart would increase the heart rate and increase the stroke volume in normal patients to increase what is lost in the dialysis from the ultrafiltration. If we miss this autonomic neuropathy, we will have an intrabiotic hypertension. So the pathogenesis, like decreased cardiac output, decreased total peripheral resistance, excess ultrafiltration challenges, overall inadequate plasma refilling and decreased cardiac output. A decline in blood volume and impaired in vascular resistance in the background of reduced cardiovascular reserve already patient has a cardiovascular impairment with impaired organ perfusion leading to uh, uh, permanent damage. So frequent assessment of dry weight attempting to reduce intradiuretic weight gain and prescribing more frequent, longer treatment may aid in preventing intradiuretic hypotension. So intradiuretic hypotension is not just a symptom of hypotension and the nursing intervention. We have an ischemic injury to the organs during these ischemic diseases. The organs like heart, the vascular axis, the cerebral and the residual kidney function. You can experience this in this patient's myocardial infarction, cardiac mortality, closure from poses of the arteriovenous fistula, very common and very famous. Cerebral ischemia and the hypoperfusion may lead to major concern, decrease the cognitive function, could be as well during and after dialysis, and in, uh, uh, intradiuretic hypotension independently associated with approximately uh, one minute per minute per square meter lower mean 
urea creatine. So uh, intradiet hypotension affected definitely the residual kidney function. Many studies on that in a retrospective manner, many centers and uh, five years follow up, autonomic neuropathy like in diabetes or long-term dialysis patients, especially on low flux, not in high efficient or high flux dialysis, may be a heart response with heart rate response during exercise is associated with increase of intraday hypotension and more survival in hemodialysis patients. The time of onset is very, very critical. If you experience hypotension during what is the first hour, exclude ultrafiltration effect. You should investigate the patient probably for the cardiac insult, autonomic neuropathy, plasma refilling, serum albumin, inflammation, and has the worst survival. So the timing of the onset of intraventric hypotension is crucial. A lot of studies on that, including more than 4,000 patients, nearly uh, three quarters of a million of hemodialysis patients in 21 US dialysis clinics. And they conclude that the incidence of intraventric hypotension during the early part of hemodialysis, which when compared to later episodes associated with clinical parameters and mortality. So describe exactly to each patient the time of onset of intradiuretic hypotension in the first half of session defined as early onset. What is the consequences of intradiuretic hypotension? Is timing everything? A major complication of hemodialysis is myocardial stunning, decreasing myocardial blood flow by 30%, decreasing the myocardial contractility. This is called the stunning. Why it is stunning? Because after the session, the myocardium begins to peg its contractility. However, it does not retain peg, it's called hypernating. So we have two terms here, myocardial stunning, which is a temporary decrease of the myocardial contraction during the session and regain peg after the session, while hypernating, meaning that the heart cannot regain its full function. Both of them lead to myocardial fibrosis and heart failure. So the, we have two arms. The risk of death is increased. Patients with hypovolemia due to inassessment of the volume and the hypervolemia, both of them increase the risk of death. Hypotension can induce access from pauses, end organ ischemia, faster loss of residual kidney function, while hypervolemia can induce hypertension, edema, deathly fatigue, cardiac remodeling, and heart failure. So the consequences of the blood pressure and the volume abnormalities in dialysis, in particular hemodialysis, for sure BD, is much less effect on the uh, uh, cardiac uh, dysfunction, the dramatic movement of extracorporeal circuit and the volume. Including on that intervention, we will get later to this slide, that patient-related factor is important. Dialysis-related factor like thermal stress, vasodilatations from the drugs of endotoxins or pepsemia or bacteremia, hypotension, patient-related factors like poor ultrafiltration control, higher intradiuretic would gain autonomic dysfunction, heart failure, and a decrease of the vascular com compliance and vascular stiffness. Acute planning is set on myocardial performance and these findings not in many literature, but on the update of that, they found as well patients with intradiuretic hypotension as a very higher rate of peripheral arterial disorders and disease. So could be as a compensation for that, or both of them are attributed to intradiuretic hypotension, but my belief that frequent intradiuretic hypotension can increase the arterial stenosis, thrombosis, ischemia, atherosclerosis. So having intradiuretic hypotension, more than 30% of the dialysis session per patient during a given 30 days interval was associated with 24% higher hazard than having newly recognized peripheral arterial disease in subsequent 30 days. What about the CMS? 
We all find that in some patients, you can have different in consciousness, cognitive dysfunctions, and we can attribute to dialysis equilibrium. Not dialysis equilibrium, but it is due to decreased cerebral blood flow, what's called here cerebral stunning. And investigating this cerebral blood flow and the cognitive function in hemodialysis patients, we found a correlation. And the conclusion that hemodialysis is capable of inducing transient cerebral stunning, offering one mechanism of cerebral injury in end stage renal disease. What is the prevalence of intradiet hypotension? A lot of the study and the range is different between 10 to 20% on patients with different variables. In this study, in the multi-center study, in patients with systemic review and meta-analysis, the percent usually lies between 10 to 20% per individual patient. But on the other hand, each patient, how much episodes of intradiet hypotension occurs? This is more critical than global percent of intradiet hypotension. If you can find that more patients requiring intradiet hypotension, you have to check your water treatment stations, conductivity meters on the hemodialysis machines and the others. If you find a, a single patient has very frequent intradiet hypotension, exclude pericardial tamponade, cardiovascular diseases, malnutrition, inflammation, septicemia, cancer, and even pulmonary chowers. So the prevalence of intradiet hypotension in conventional hemodialysis with meta-analysis, including in that patients in 26 studies, the systemic meta-analysis, the prevalence intradiet hypotension is around from 10 to 20 percent if we define by a single nether of below 90 definition. Returning back to the audience, a single definition of intradiet hypotension is usually not enough. So we have to combine decreased in systolic blood pressure accompanied by symptoms and the nursing intervention for uh, uh, relieving that the volume and stopping the dialysis ultrafiltration decreasing the blood flow are all the marks of intradiuretic hypertension plus just a single measurement of intradiuretic blood pressure. So the risk including diabetes, weight gain, female, lower and higher body mass index are increasing the intradiuretic hypertension. Again, the time is important and you can find that here, the automated blood pressure measurements indicated and hemodialysis interval used to define every nearly 15 minutes, you can find that how much the patient till the from the start till the end of the dialysis session can experience intradiuretic hypotension. We uh, uh, remarked that before, in the early one hour, first one hour, there is the high stress. Here in this study, including that, the mortality and survival probability between early versus late intradiuretic hypotension, so the early onset of uh, intradiuretic hypotension can not the intradiuretic hypotension per se, but mostly due to autonomic dysfunction, malnutrition, and other possible causes. What is the hemodynamic instability related to renal replacement therapy? The term could be applied for hemodynamic uh, instability for hemodialysis insufficiency or uh, hypotension. However, if you combine that, you can find that probably hemodynamic instability could be related not only to the, the decrease in systolic blood pressure, but probably other way, like sudden cardiac death. Patient in systolic blood pressure is okay, but sudden cardiac death. This is hemodynamic instability or arrhythmia, like atrial fibrillation. <laughs> so we have a cardiac function here for the hemodial instability, including low cardiac output, failure to increase the heart rate, also low dialysis calcium. I believe that all of us using a dialysis calcium of 1.5, never to use 1.25, except in very, very 
uh, special cases when hypercalcemia uh, is present because hemodynamic probably due to actin myosin contraction of the myocardium and uh, calcium uh, channels could be related to myocardial contraction in this way. Or lack of the vasoconstriction effect, we will discuss in brief that splanking vasodilatation is the missing. What is the splanking vasodilatation and eating during the session? Tissue skin, ischemia and the hypertensive medication. So we have a hypovolemic stress, either in acute or chronic kidney disease, in maintenance hemodialysis, micro and microvascular disease, cardiac failure, right ventricular and the blood volume effectiveness, and effectiveness uh, circulation of the uh, blood volume will decrease the cardiac output. The effective circulating blood volume, meaning that what is the volume of the blood inside the intravascular, not pooling in the splanking or the, in the peripheral vessel. So the venous return or the preload is very important for the blood volume to manage the heart. As we discussed before, the heart is just a pump and the pump can just pushing what is presented to it. So this cardiac output and intradilatic hypotension. What is missing? The first driver in the path of physiology before is intradiatic hypotension is the decline in blood volume due to ultrafiltration. However, intradiatic blood pressure behavior shows that largest blood pressure drop occurred in the first 20 to 25% of the dialysis treatment first hour. This suggests that other factors beyond volume, like rapid osmolar and electrolyte checks, or new hormonal and inflammatory pathway may also affect the intradialytic blood pressure response. Impaired vascular resistance, decreasing the venous return, like a thermal stress on the heart if you are using higher temperature, not isothermic temperature to the patient, we will induce venous dilatation, decreasing the venous return and decreasing the cardiac output. So that's why cooling of the dilatate can improve the systemic circulation and improve the intradilatic hypotension. What is the venous system? To our colleagues, the venous system divides into two main parts. The stress part, which is the driving force for the venous return, and the unstressed part is the theoretical volume remaining in the circulation. What is resting inside the vein is the unstressed and what is coming to the heart is the stress part. The major resting of the uh, blood in the vein is the unstressed volume. So we are playing with some form of the uh, stressed volume inside the vein. Looking for that, if we have a disturbances between the stress and non-stress, we'll find that the splanking part plays the major role than the peripheral vein. The splanking part show transient signs, a main reservoir for unstressed volume, has very compliant vessels, hypovolemia under uh, thermoneutral conditions, including splanking, venous system plays the largest role in, in the immediate response. So the splanking is a reservoir for changes in the intravascular compartment. If we push the splanking circulation, we will lose the venous return and the drop of blood pressure. What is exactly happened in our centers from heavy needs during the dialysis? So the intradiet hypotension and the splanking shifting, integrating and overlooked mechanism with detection of ischemia-related signal during hemodialysis. Splanking back form an important circuitry reservoir. So disorder of any of the splanking circulation may attribute to the multi-organ dysfunction syndrome and vice versa. Here is the splanking circulation, and you can find that the venous return and the heart and the, to the uh, uh, liver and come in fact with the inferior vena cava, while resting splanking blood flow is typically 25 to 30 percent of circulation, interchanging with the reservoir of the venous system. However, with eating, it, it, it's exceeding many times. So there is definitely intradialytic complications. Others from the spanking leak, including vasodilators, radicalines, adenosine, nitric oxide, 
And we all know that what is protein pound uremic toxin is coming from the gut. And so if you don't have awareness of the GIP in hemodialysis station, you will have many uh, complications. So mechanism of intradiuretic hypotension instability with uh, renal replacement therapy. We have here resting wall motion abnormalities of the myocardium. Plasma referring rate is affected. We'll go, go uh, back uh, directly for that in a few uh, minutes. Renal replacement therapy factors, thermal and the ultrafiltration profiling. Protocrete, many of uh, the genius does not know what is a protocrete. Protocrete like hematocrete. Hematocrete is the amount of red blood cells inside the blood and the plasma uh, fraction. However, protocrete means the protein content and its relation to the volume. So this is diagrammatic, uh, uh, allowing us to understand that in patients in renal replacement therapy related factors, the modality differs intermittent versus slow or continuous renal replacement therapy. The ultrafiltration rate, the osmolality, the dialysis temperature, the dialysis sodium and calcium, and the buffer as well as the dialysis membrane. Inadequate physiologic response will lead to hemodynamic instability. The hypovolemia and the plasma refilling rate is important. Plasma refilling rate is defined by the volume of the interstitium and intracellular part of water comes to the intravascular compartment. So by this volume can do a plasma refilling to compensate what has been uh, uh, removed by ultrafiltration. Plasma on cortic pressure depends mainly on the serum albumin. And if you have a problem in the plasma on cortic pressure, you will lose the function of the albumin and protein in the dragging the water and fluid from the interstitial. So bradycardia, vasodilatation, and the hypotension, increasing in the resting wall motion abnormality in the myocardial spanning, systolic and the diastolic dysfunction. So we have here problematic of the hemodynamic instability and death. Higher dialysis calcium has cons and pros. It has a hemodynamic stability. However, it induces more vascular calcification and can induce a dynamic bone disease with net calcium balance, positive balance. So it should be managed according to the patient's serum calcium as well and hemodynamically uh, stability. Endotoxemia from the water impurification coming from bacteria or biofilm Travel rapidly to the blood induces very inflammatory reaction, not always with a pyrogenic reaction because you need a huge amount of endotoxin to have shivering rigors. But if you have endotoxemia below the range of five endotoxin units per kg per hour, you have a vasodilatation and the release of cytokines and induce hypotension. What is the maximum ultrafiltration and the theories on that? Especially in patients with acute kidney injury, dialysis dependent outcome. In this study, in this protocol for limiting ultrafiltration goal and the number of intradiuretic hypotensive episodes may promote renal recovery of patients with acute kidney injury, dialysis dependent in outpatient setting. So the analysis of net ultrafiltration has that what's called a G-shaped. You can compensate between hypervolemia and the hypovolemia. If you have a higher ultrafiltration rate, the recovery of acute kidney injury will be delayed and may be progressed to end stage kidney disease. The acute regeneration therapy, depending largely on what other organs affected in AKI. If the patient in the ICU and you are doing renal replacement therapy, be in mind that many of the inotropics could be dialysable, especially if you are using CRRT. 
Many of them, or the most of them, are of multi organ. And you have septemia, interleukin 1, 6, TNF, interleukin 18, and the other. All are depressing for the myocardial contraction. So, renal replacement therapy alone could improve by removing fluid electrolyte imbalance, but on the other hand, can affect the hemodynamic instability. So we had here vasodilatation in sepsis mainly, as well reduced cardiac output, including tumor necrosis factor in Tarikon 1, 6, 18, as produced during acute kidney injury and the multi-organ dysfunction. Reduction in preload, what is the heart to have to pump due to absolute or relative hypovolemia, with the increased preload and the cardiac dysfunction associated with volume overload. So the heart is suffering from decreased preload and probably potentially loaded with cytokines and other uremic toxins, which impaired its contractility. So the support of that, of the mechanism to understand the pathophysiology and to deal with critically ill patients in ICU with acute kidney injury needing renal replacement therapy, we have to bear in mind that right ventricular pressure, left ventricular pressure, myocardial contractility, looking for the cardiodepressant substances released from the patient or from uh, the ICU treatment, the vascular tool, and if you are using CRRT, take care of hypothermia, considering volume reduction, and I understand that uh, commonly in ICU using centravenous pressure, However, if you are using ventilators, you may have a false positive height and should be corrected to the accuracy by lung ultrasound and other to, the, to uh, just determine the intravascular uh, spaces. Hypothermia is problematic. Inappropriate ultrafiltration and refilling is also as well a problematic. So in key hemodynamic instability, need a multi-work from the ICU point of view and the renal point of view, just to control electrolytes and volume and removing uremic toxins and other substance would improve the outcome of the acute kidney injury. So the volume overload on the other hand can induce sudden increase in ventricular volume by stolic stretch, stretch with mechanoelectrical feedback. What is called that? If the stretch happens more than expected, the heart will go to ventricular ectopy, tachycardia or fibrillation. With heterogeneous activation of the uh, channels, ion channels inside the myocardial and depressed function. Probable treatment of renal replacement therapy can improve the cardiac contraction and the cardiac status and improve the recovery from acute kidney injury. However, this is a clinical scenario by fluid removal, by filtration of the cardiodepressant molecules like sepsis and trauma, and here I am calling that. Low flux is not allowed to be used in ICU in patients with traumatic or septicemia because you have to use superflux or CRRT hemodial filtration to remove more of the cytokine or myocardial depression. Correction of electrolyte and acid base, removal of DAM and PAM, which is a stimulus for immune reaction during trauma or sepsis. <laughs> pulmonary edema and pulmonary hypertension, importantly as well. As we say that there's many patients with maintenance hemodialysis as a pulmonary hypertension. And during that, they may suffer from hypoxemia, pulmonary edema, especially in patient ICU on mechanical ventilation can increase the right ventricular after load. Consequently, right ventricular dysfunction can affect the left ventricular preload, leading to more and more hemodynamic instability. So the pulmonary edema and the pulmonary hypertension increasing the load on the right ventricle and induce hypoxemia, subsequently, we have a cardiac depressant effect. 
So hemodynamic instability related to renal replacement therapy could be, be, could be defined as in patients with acute kidney injury, as well in patients on maintenance hemodialysis, frequently in critical care, may affect recovery by organ spasm and acute kidney injury with frequent episodes of hypotension, while in maintenance hemodialysis, commonly called intradiuretic hypotension, and it's multifactorial. What is ultrafiltration limit? In hemodialysis, we understand that the, our upper limit is 10 milli per kg uh, per hour uh, for dialysis. However, we have many tools to measure that by blood volume monitoring. For the state type of blood volume response to constant ultrafiltration, these four types flat line through the whole session, nothing happened. Type two, flat the during the first part of the dialysis following by a linear decrease during the remaining time, which mainly uh, appear after two hours of the dialysis. Or type two, linear decrease from the start of dialysis, not sharp drop of the blood pressure. And type four, linear decrease first intervention, followed by a flat uh, uh, line during the remaining time. And this is type four is very common in patients needing to push some fluids at the start of dialysis in patients with autonomic neuropathy, because simply you cannot compensate the, what loss for the blood outside the body of around 300 to 400 milli. Mm -hmm. So pushing saline at the start of dialysis can uh, abolish the type four drop. We know that Japanese are more meticulous in patients on dialysis, either on acute or on maintenance hemodialysis. Even in diuretics, they are not giving mega doses of diuretics. However, in patients with, uh, uh, in the other world are giving prosimide up to one gram uh, per day, in the Japanese, little is about 100 or 125 to 125. On that, based on a failure of dialytic dose, hypervolemia can be indicated for renal replacement therapy. So Japanese are very meticulous in dialysis and even very meticulous in diuretic rules. So the intermittent or continuous or isolated ultrafiltration in critical ill patients, we know that it is called sequential ultrafiltration, either by blood circuit alone needing for that the transplant brain pressure, keeping dripping of the dialysis outside of the ultrafiltrate, or by negative ultrafiltration, and this is especially used in dialysis related uh, hemodialysis or CRRT. And here the ultrafiltration by negative pressure in CRRT treatment, and we can use intradialytic just the dribbling of the ultrafiltration outside by calling the isolate. And this is the G-shaped curve for ultrafiltration rate. If we are using net ultrafiltration below one milli per kg per hour, or fast ultrafiltration net above 1.75, we'll have the risk. So this is called a G-shaped reflex because lower ultrafiltration, the patient died from organ edema, higher ultrafiltration, the patient died from organ ischemia. So the comparative impact of isolated ultrafiltration and hemolysis on fluid distribution and the bioimpedance, if you look to this study, you can find that if you are using just isolated ultrafiltration, you can remove 5% of the extracellular water and 3.6% of intracellular water. If you are using hemodialysis plus ultrafiltration, there is a drop of the intracellular water removal to 3% and the higher of the intravascular uh, drop or intravascular component a uh, drop for that and subsequently patient may experience this, especially in the early phase of dialysis to have intradialytic hypotension. What is the plasma refilling in, in very fast plasma refilling meaning that the heart, the plasma could be compensated by oncotic pressure to attain what has been removed by dialysis from the interstitium, and it is depending mainly on the plasma oncotic pressure. 
<coughs> and here you can find in the plasma protein sector that increasing the ultrafiltration can increase the plasma hemoconcentration and the protocrease of protein. But if the patient is suffering from hypoalbuminemia, we will have a problematic of the plasma refilling. So ultrafiltration with poor plasma refilling, like in autonomic neuropathy, ineffective sympathetic nervous system, factor leading to vasodilatation, meals on dialysis increase splanky blood flow, increased production of gastric flow. And that's why in some patients, you can find that pushing saline at the start of the dialysis, meaning that if the patient connection like that, you would have to wait till the blood reaches the dialyzer and pushing outside the saline, but here you can push by a peg or other means to including that the volume had been drawn back from the uh, blood and coming instead of saline. So this is some of the measures that compete for intradiuretic hypotension at the start or the early phase of the hemodialysis station. Here, so this is a transcapillary refilling and the proteins meaning that Plasma refilling was measured using real time, minute by minute relative blood volume changes. And there is always a lag of the plasma refilling. What had been removed should be compensated from the interstitium to maintain a hemodynamic instability. Usually there is a lag of around 30 to 60 minutes of the plasma refilling. So this is a critical period of intradialytic hypotension. Because if you are using high ultrafiltration rate here, you will have a sharp drop of the intravascular component. And still, there is not sufficient plasma refilling because there is usually a lag of around 30 to 60 minutes. So one of the therapy is to smooth down the ultrafiltration at the start of the dialysis, and you can make higher ultrafiltration later on on patient experience with that. So this is a protocrete equivalent to the hematocrete and the protocrete increase water movement from the interstitium, but of course has bad effect on patients on dialysis like hemodifiltration because it blocks the dialysis membrane, making clogging and failure of the uh, uh, filtration. So if you have a fluid removal with ultrafiltration, there is increased plasma on cotic pressure, the oncotic recall of water from the interstitium with no intradiuretic hypertension. If you are using excess ultrafiltration rate, and if you are experienced low serum alcohol or plasma proteins, you will experience intradiuretic hypertension. So alcohol is related mainly to the production from the liver, but if you have septicemia or toxemia or any inflammation, you will have a lot of cytokines that reduce albumin synthesis. Also, albumin transcapillary escape, meaning that albumin leaves the intravascular compartment to the interstitium in patients with volume overload. So it makes the problem more complicated because increasing the volume increases the hydrostatic pressure, making the albumin escape. It's called albumin transcapillary escape. It usually regains back by the lymphatic or the absorption. However, if you have a high in hypervolemia in hemodialysis, a higher trans uh, uh, capillary escape, you will have a problem of the oncotic pressure, subsequently intradiuretic hypertension. If you have as well a patient with chronic liver disease and you don't have proper senses of albumin, you will have um, a problem as well in the oncotic pressure and intradiuretic hypertension. So inflammation, anorexia, vas dilatation, excess catabolism, increase the transcapillary albumin leak, escaping from the intravascular to the interstitial part. Back to the final. I understand that if we, all of us, had been aware by the all six items we discussed, we can now plan the management of intradiuretic hypertension and should be located directly to the cause. For example, if you have a malnutrition inflammation complex syndrome, if you have a hypoalbuminemia, if you have a vascular access sepsis, infection, you will not treat intradiuretic hypertension. So we have to treat the cause, 
promoting that for nutritional and inflammatory status is crucial for these patients. Other than that, malnutrition inflammation is important because ongoing vascular calcification is higher. So the conceptual framework of individualizing dialysis prescription, including the patient size, the patient age, the lifestyle, what other comorbidities, what is the basic cardiac function, what is the residual kidney function, and you, could, you can plan a lot of hemodialysis process on the ultrafiltration profile, calcium, magnesium, glucose in the dialysate is a missing because glucose is important to stop the patient to have hypoglycemia and to stop the patient eating with his planking pooling of more than uh, uh, could access for intravascular trait. So the active goal for that is to treat the patient individually. For sure, peritoneal dialysis is one of the solutions to move the patient from recurrent intradiuretic hypotension to less vascular and intradiuretic complication by BD. So this is the goal and the intervention include, you may include the increasing frequency, increasing the duration, cool dialysis, avoid, avoid sodium load, avoid very low calcium, decrease the intradiuretic sodium intake and fluid intake. You can use diuretics in between the session in patients with residual kidney function. And the first line, including in the intraret hypotension, immediate stop of filtration, trend in perg position, saline or alphabet infusion, reduction in blood flow. The first line preventing measures, including as well reassessment of the dry weight, the ultrafiltration, dietary intakes, food ingestion during hemodialysis, review all antihypertensive regimen, review dialysis composition. While the second line prescribe more cooler dialysis, which promote arterial vasoconstriction, improving the cardiac function. Don't push for hypothermia, and hypothermia induce myocardial drop of the contraction especially on high volume convection therapy. Third line prevention, just this is the third line to give the midodrine or others. So importantly, not to jump to midodrine for patients on dialysis, but look for the cause. And this is schematic presentation for all the sequelae and procedure we can manage a patient with intradiuretic hypotension. Now we understand the plasma refilling, so don't push ultrafiltration at the first hour. We understand higher dialysis uh, sodium will do thirst, higher intradiuretic would gain hypertension, cooler dialysis is cardiovascular stability, low serum album, you have to manage the patient with nutritional consultation. So put for that, cool dialysis, wait for ultrafiltration, manage nutrition and inflammation. And this is all the technical view. Sodium profiling is prohibited because more mortality has a prognostic value blood volume monitoring we will come in a few seconds. Ultrafiltration profiling, isolated ultrafiltration can improve the change in osmolality, temperature biofeedback and the hemodiafiltration can improve the hemodynamic instability. Relative blood volume, it is an online with frequent and many of the device or the feedback control and it's widely used of the relative blood volume device can changing the philosophy of our ultrafiltration and estimated from the hemoconcentration marker. And this hemotecrete based ultrafiltration in common use and depending on online measurement of blood hematocrit and hypoxemia and on a graph you can record as well patient blood pressure symptoms and this online monitoring system could support individualization of ultrafiltration because it can detect the hemoconcentration effect at the start or at the end in the presence of attacks of hypotension 
or if the patient symptom like dizziness either starting or at the late of the dialysis. The coronary stone is our clinical judgment. Clinical judgment is the first and the last point to use these tools. So optimize hemodynamic management, tight control of the volume, sodium and blood pressure, enhance global replacement therapy, hemodifiltration is one of the standard and uh, preferred for intrathetic hemodynamic instability, personalization of the renal replacement therapy to patient risk and intolerance to ultrafiltration. So this is a schematic presentation. Our clinical judgment is the first. You can use biomarker on research. We cannot use these biomarkers on routine use. We can use instrumental as well in selected patients like inferior vena cava diameter, chest X-ray, ultrasound of the pulmonary. And you can use functional image like sodium, it is on the research field, and then personalization. Use online tools or offline tools like bioevidence, cardiac biomarkers, and bilateral blood pressure changes. Use online tools like blood pressure monitoring, blood volume monitoring, control ultrafiltration, ultrafiltration profiling, as well thermal profiling for the patient who cannot tolerate uh, hypothermic uh, tyrosine. So this is an integrated approach, controlling all the uh, uh, cascades of intradialytic hypotension and the cardiac medication and the intervention. Lastly, patient may need coronary bypass or coronary angiography. And to prevent of intradiuretic hypotension, you need to understand what is mean by intradiuretic hypotension, and you can maximize all of these parameters in an individual phase treatment. Other disorders may mimic intradiuretic hypotension, like hypersensitivity reactions to drugs or to the heart membrane, uh, bleeding could be a cause, especially GIT bleeding immediate hypo, uh, uh, hypoxemia intradialytic or bowel ischemia and the release of cytokine during the start of that. So this dialyzer reaction, sometimes intradialytic hypotension immediately when starting the dialysis, stop after we change the dialysis membrane or the sterilization could be from gamma, for example, we shift to the steam, could be from polysulfone, we shift to topo, more like puerima or polyether or polyamide. So this is a scheme. Be care that for the genuine, don't use sodium profiling. Don't increase sodium more than the physiological. Optimize your patient without need to increase the conductivity to 140, for example, because this will be a, a vicious circle of hypertension followed by hypotension inside volume overload. You cannot remove excess water by this way. So since all of that is important. Consider giving normal saline or albumin in patients with hypoalbuminemia. Both of them could help in intradialytic hypotension without so much remarks between the outcome. And intravenous albumin could attain how much one gram of albumin given intravenous can give the pressure 18 milli of water from the interstitial. So if you are using, for example, 20% of uh, 100 cc of album, you got 20 grams of albumin, immediately can attain 360 milli of the interstitial at once. So you can give 100 milli of human albumin, 20%, to compensate for the intradiuretic hypotension habit at the start of the dialysis. So this is all keeping in mind that lower dialysis temperature and slower blood flow in patients experience intradiuretic hypertension should be considered in most of cases. And in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, colleagues and professor, despite the advances in hemodialysis, still this is a very dominant in its pathogenesis as a compensation, uh, combination of a decline in blood volume in a background of reduced cardiovascular reserves. And be aware that intradiuretic hypotension and escaping
from the dialysis patient who would like to have three times dialysis because the experience complication make him hemodialysis easier and more convenient. Frequent intradietic hypotension affects hemodialysis adequacy. And thank you very much.